God bless you and thank you for living for the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word has been written for everyone. In fact, the Lord wishes that none should perish, but that everyone would come to faith in Christ. When we come to faith in Christ, we have an enemy. And the enemy's deception is to convince people that they could be made right with God and guaranteed a place in heaven above by performing certain ceremonies. Listen, salvation is never by works. The natural man or woman instinctively wants to believe that somehow they could be made right by themselves with God by their own human efforts. And you could never string enough good days together to earn heaven. In fact, listen to what the Lord says about boasting in our own strength, our own might. Jeremiah chapter nine. Thus saith the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boast, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. Listen carefully, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. He mentions Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all those inhabiting the desert who clip the hair on their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are, and here's the key, uncircumcised of heart. We're gonna deal with issues, matters of the heart today. Paul establishes that Abraham was saved through God's grace and not by being circumcised or by keeping the law. Paul's argument was that if Abraham was saved through faith by God's grace, and he was, then every other person must be justified on the same basis. And if Abraham could not be justified by being circumcised or by keeping the law, then neither could any other person. I trust you're going to profit greatly by this text of scripture and studying it together. Join me as we ask the Lord in prayer for his power today. Father, thank you for meeting with us every time we come into your presence. We love you, Lord, and we love your word. And I pray, Father, that you would manifest yourself to us today as we study your unchanging holy word. I pray that our lives would never be the same as we meet together in fellowship around your word. So thank you for loving us. Thank you for pursuing us. May we bring glory to God with our lives together today. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen and amen. Follow along as I read, beginning in Romans chapter 4, verse 9. Is this blessing then upon the circumcised or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be reckoned to them, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also follow in the steps of the faith of our father, Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Verse 14, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified for the law brings about wrath, but there 
Where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it is by faith. Verse 16 is critical. For this reason, it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the sight of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. And may the Lord add his blessing to the public reading of his word. The first biblical truth that I want you to see, Abraham was not justified by circumcision. Paul had anticipated the question that his Jewish audience would be asking at this point in his argument goes like this, if Abraham was justified by his faith alone, why did God demand circumcision of Abraham and of all of his descendants? It's a legitimate question. Most Jewish people in the New Testament were thoroughly convinced that circumcision was not only the unique mark that set them apart from all of the people. They were God's chosen people, but was also the means by which they became acceptable to God. Paul had come out of a strongly legalistic Jewish background. He knew exactly where they were coming from. Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul was circumcised the eighth day. Paul was a Hebrew among Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee. Yet the Holy Spirit had revealed to the great apostle Paul, as well as to the Jerusalem council, they had acknowledged that neither circumcision nor any other religious ceremony nor any human act, no matter how divinely ordained, could bring salvation. It's through faith in Christ. The act of circumcision had never saved a Jewish man. It could never save a Gentile man. Paul, therefore, warned his fellow believers, especially Jewish believers, in Philippians chapter 3, to beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision. It deals with our heart. We worship in spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in religious ceremony. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything when it comes to salvation. It's faith working through love. A stronger warning was actually given to the Jewish believers in Galatians chapter 5. It was for freedom. This is Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. Do not subject again yourselves to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. It has always been by faith. Christ is looking for faith in every believer's life. Now, the natural question to be asked would be, well, then why circumcision? And I'm glad you've asked that question. Why did God make that right as personal as it is a binding law on all of Abraham's descendants? Well, first of all, Paul says, right in our text, circumcision was a sign. Abraham received the sign of circumcision. Circumcision was the physical mark of identity for God's people. Circumcision was also a mark of God's covenant, not only a sign, but God's covenant setting Abraham's descendants apart 
as uniquely God's chosen people. The Hebrews, that was the language they spoke, or the Jewish people as they became known as the Babylonian exile during the wilderness wanderings in the Sinai desert, circumcision was not performed by that disobedient generation. By the way, God allowed that disobedient generation to die out before they could enter the promised land. But when God readied his people to enter the land of Canaan, which he had promised, the mark of circumcision was reinstituted by Joshua. We read about it in Joshua chapter five. It was under the direct command from the Lord God Almighty. There's a second reason. Circumcision was a seal. It was a seal of righteousness, of faith, which he, Abraham, had while circumcised. Abraham believed God. That's critical. God had revealed his heart long before the apostle Paul began this Roman letter. Moses had declared back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, moreover the Lord your God will, here it is, circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, in order that you may live. It's always been the condition of our heart. God had always wanted, first of all, to cut away the sin that covers the heart. It invades the mind. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, Jeremiah proclaims in Jeremiah chapter four, break up your fallow ground. Do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart. Men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. God's always been concerned with the deeds of our hands, the thoughts of our mind and our heart. Israel was a testimony that men's hearts needed cleansing, that the, the children of Israel, they needed spiritual circumcision. Now there's a second biblical truth. Abraham was not justified by the law. He was not justified by circumcision and Abraham is not justified by the law. It's the second truth in this passage that Abraham was not justified by the right of circumcision, but he was also not justified by keeping the Mosaic law. The law was not revealed to Moses until more than 500 years after Abraham lived. That patriarch obviously had no way of knowing what the law required. When Abraham was declared right with God, he was neither circumcised nor in possession of the Mosaic law. Now think about that. Circumcision had not yet been required by God and the law had not yet been revealed by God. Therefore, the promise to Abraham, which was extended to his descendants, that he would be heir of the world, was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Are you beginning to see how critical your faith, how important your faith is? For the promise to Abraham was given in God's covenant with Abraham in which the patriarch was told that his descendants would be heirs of the world. In Genesis chapter 15, we read, and he, that's God, took him, Abraham, outside. And God says to Abraham, now look toward the heavens, count the stars if you are able to count them. And God said to Abraham, so shall your descendants be then Abraham believed in the Lord and God reckoned it to Abraham as righteousness. God looks at you that way as, as well. Your faith is so critically important to God. God's promise to Abraham had four significant factors and we see it in the text here. First, the promise involved a land in which Abraham would live, but that would not be possessed until 
some 500 years, five centuries later, when Joshua led the Israelites in their conquest of Canaan. Amazing. God's time schedule is different than yours or mine. Now, the second promise, the promise involved a people who would be so numerous that they could not be numbered. In fact, in Genesis 13, like the dust of the earth and the stars of the sky, eventually Abraham would become the father of many nations. There's a third promise, and this promise involved a blessing of the entire world through Abraham's descendants. And the fourth promise would be fulfilled in the giving of a redeemer who would be a descendant of Abraham through whom the whole world would be blessed by the provision of salvation. Abraham trusted that somehow God would provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So by faith, this is Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He, Abraham, considered that God was able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. Justification has never been through the law. Justification has never been through circumcision. Men and women are justified by faith, faith in Jesus Christ. There's the third biblical truth. It's very important today. It's verses 16 and 17. Abraham was justified by God's grace. God reckoned the believer's faith as righteousness in order that salvation might be in accordance with grace. The power of salvation or justification is in God's grace. It's not just in men and women's faith. Abraham's faith was not in itself righteousness, but was reckoned to him as righteousness. It was on the basis of Jesus Christ who would give himself graciously and he would provide for believers, including Abraham and Sarai, the righteousness that was needed. Grace is the divine power that brings justification in order that the promise may be certain to all his descendants. Now think about this with me. The fact that Paul is here speaking of spiritual, not physical descendants is made clear by his going on to say, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's very clear in scripture. The apostle Paul's point here is that God reckoned Abraham's faith as righteousness before any such distinctions were made. It was for that reason that Abraham's faith was a universal faith that applies to all mankind, not merely to Jews, but to those who are of the law. It was for that reason Abraham became the father of us all. And that is all of us who trust in Jesus Christ. I hope you've trusted in Jesus Christ and made him your Messiah. It's regardless of racial or religious heritage. Think about it. Abraham was a pagan living in an, an idolatrous region with his father, Terah. They were living among ungodly sinners, worshiping idols. They trusted not in their own efforts, but in God's gracious provision. And Abraham believed when God called him. Justification by faith occurred well before there was any law. Paul uses scripture as his defense as it is written, he's actually referring to Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, where Paul, he quotes this, a father of many nations have I made you. The promise of Abraham was fulfilled in the sight of him, God, whom he believed. Lest there be any doubt about what God, Paul, was speaking, because he's coming against idol worship in Rome, 
the Apostle Paul gives two qualifications. Here are the qualifications. First, this God is the creator who gives life to the dead. Abraham had experienced firsthand that power of God to give life to the dead. And second qualification, God is the creator who calls into being that which does not exist. Paul here obviously is referring to God's power as expressed through creation in which what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Hebrews chapter 11 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. God is the one true living God who calls people, places, and events into existence solely by his divine, sovereign power and determination. Abraham witnessed God's supernatural and divine power, which has no equal. Do you know this God? Have you received his son Jesus by faith? Why was circumcision given? It was a sign and it was a seal. That's in our text today. Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. That righteousness might be reckoned to them. Romans 4, 11. Righteousness is reckoned to you by faith, by believing. Now as a sign, it was an evidence that Abraham belonged to God and believed God's promise. As a seal, it was a reminder to Abraham that God had given the promise and would keep it. God keeps his word. Now believers today are sealed by the power of of the Holy Spirit of God. If you've received Christ, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13, in him, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, here it is, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of God's glory. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Abraham, let's be clear, he was justified before the law was given. Abraham was justified by believing God's promise. It was not by obeying God's law. God's law uh, had not yet been given. The promise to Abraham was given solely through God's grace, Abraham's faith joined in God's grace. Abraham did not earn it. He did not merit it. Today, you and I cannot earn it or merit God's grace. God justifies the ungodly. It's because you believe in God's gracious promise, his unchanging word. Thank you for being a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so grateful that you live generously and sacrificially and support the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I are the church, therefore we're to live boldly. So this coming week, I want you to look for divine appointments, opportunities to tell others about Jesus. And so until we meet again, I want you to live for Christ. Put him first in your life and live for Christ. Haven't I commanded you, haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, be strong and courageous.